I'm Jonathan Braylock. I'm Jarrah Milligan. And I'm James the Third. And we're the hosts of Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood. It's a comedic podcast that reviews films with leading actors of color and analyzes them in the context of race and Hollywood's diversity issues. Yeah. Listen to new episodes on Mondays. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. I don't care where you get them. I just want you to listen. Don't threaten the people. We need them to listen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, guys. Listen. <laughs> listen to us. Yay. Yeah, put on a happy voice. Really? What more can I say? You know what it is. Black men can jump. Hey, Mom and Daughter Fighting listeners. We're off today because it's Juneteenth, but we didn't want to leave you without an episode. So we're bringing you an interesting and perhaps kind of provocative conversation from Slate's podcast, Hear Me Out. The episode is from a few weeks back, but we thought it was still relevant seeing as we just celebrated Father's Day. I'm going to hand the mic over to host Celeste Headley, and we'll see you back here on Thursday. Welcome to Hear Me Out. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. As we enter the summer months already, it means we're also approaching two kind of fraught holidays for lots of Americans, Mother's Day and Father's Day. Now, you might think of these holidays as silly or superficial or commercialized beyond belief, but their origins are deeply political. And parenting, whether you like it or not, is political as well. To be a parent means being in a really complicated relationship with a person who didn't necessarily choose to be there. So in the best of circumstances, is bringing a kid into the world a selfish act if they can't consent to be here? Consider this, maybe kids don't owe their parents anything. Yeah, you deserve a day off, but the idea that your kids owe you that, no, you owe your kids. It's hard to be alive and you force them to be alive. Writer and influencer Gabrielle Blair joins us on Hear Me Out in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. You know, Mother's Day is often celebrated these days with fancy brunches, flower deliveries, maybe some Hallmark cards. But its origins in the U.S. actually date back to the mid-1800s. For many decades after the Civil War, small local groups and churches pushed for some kind of holiday commemorating both motherhood and the loss of children, specifically in wartime. And that sentiment carried through the turn of the century and into the origin of the holiday we know today. Originally, Mother's Day was intended to honor mothers whose sons had died in the Civil War. Congress and President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the first Mother's Day on Sunday May 9th, 1914. And we know how President Wilson expected us to celebrate because he wrote, we do invite the people of the United States to display the flag at their homes or other suitable places on the second Sunday in May as a public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. Since then, of course, the flag has been replaced with chocolate and burnt toast served to you in bed. But for the record, Father's Day didn't become official in this country until 1972. And there had been a lot of complaining about that by politicians who were often fathers um, and others who felt they'd been excluded from this whole federal holiday circuit. So both Father's Day and Mother's Day may be hallmark holidays now, but they're also intrinsically political from the beginning. Raising a child is a political act these days, not to mention choosing whether to make one or bring one into the world. Now, just about any parent will tell you that they have made countless sacrifices for their children, and they would make countless more, regardless of how old the kid or adult is. But as we approach the summer season of parenting holidays, it's worth remembering that there are two independent people involved in a parent-child relationship, and one of them did not ask to be involved. We know what parents owe their kids, though that's up for debate by some people, of course. But the question we want to ask is, what do children owe their parents? And is it an inherently selfish act, in at least some sense, to bring a child into the world in the first place? So to tackle that, we are joined by Gabrielle Blair, founder of designmom.com and author of Ejaculate Responsibly. Great way to start this conversation. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you for having me. So glad to be here. So for those who don't know about your work, tell us what you do. Well, I am a mother of six. So if we're talking about parenthood and being making <laughs> selfish decisions to, to have kids, I have experience with that. I found a design mom in 2006, and I've been working online, writing, um, designing since then. And Design Mom is still going strong. It's a blog and on social presences. But um, I'm also an author. 
The book you mentioned is my second book, and it's been really fun to promote it. It's starting a lot of great conversations. Yeah, and it's kind of like the the perfect hear me out premise, right? This spicy, controversial opinion, possibly <laughs> unpopular, and then it's like, wait, hear me out, and you make a really good argument, which which brings us to the the opinion that you bring to us today, which I know is going to immediately catch the ears of a number of people. And your argument is that children don't owe their parents a damn thing, right? That's right. <laughs> okay. Why do you say this? Well, it starts with this. Your, your kids didn't have a choice to be here. You forced them to come here. You literally forced them to come to your family. And they didn't get to choose you as parents. They don't get to choose the town they live in. They don't get to choose whether or not they have siblings or what the birth order is of the siblings. They they don't get to choose the socioeconomic status that they grew up in, the the geographic location, the country. They, they really have no choice in any of this. And you force them there. And the reason you force them there, in my opinion, is for selfish reasons. You want a child. You want to raise a child. You want the experience of raising a child. Whatever Whatever is motivating you, it's you want that. You want that. And so you have the child. Um, so you, it's this selfish act ultimately. And, and I, again, I have six kids, so I've done this selfishly six times. Um, and I get it. It's like, it's evolution. It's how we, you know, uh, continue the human race. This is, this is, it. this is how it works. We have these instincts to procreate and raise children. Um, great, terrific. But that doesn't change the fact that your kids didn't have a choice to be here. And we hope they love being here. We hope they love life and that you do everything possible to make a, a terrific life for them where they get to grow and thrive and and love their life. Uh, but we know that's not always the case. A lot of people don't love their life, don't love the situation they grow up in, um, have a lot of trauma and grief because of it. And they have to work through that as adults or even as children, they have to start working through that. And the idea that... Um, children owe their parents something is, for me, it just feels illogical. If I force someone to be somewhere, the idea that they owe me something just doesn't make sense to me. I owe them. They don't owe me. Okay. So I don't know yet if I agree with you or not. So I want to kind of pick apart exactly how far this goes. Let's yeah. start with religion because you're, you okay. are Mormon, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of parents expect their children to adopt the religion that they belong to, right? And are disappointed <laughs> um, and view very and, and express that disappointment in a very number of ways, some of them quite harsh, when kids don't. So you're, right. part of your opinion is saying kids don't need to believe what you believe. Uh, I mean, for sure, 100%. And we know statistically, they don't. Children, you know, are leaving religion, not just Mormonism, all religion yeah. in droves and droves. Gen, Gen Z is just not going to be as religious as their parents were. So for sure, they don't have to believe that. And if it doesn't make sense to you, I feel like an illustration that makes it maybe a little more clear is that if you are a family in America and you, you're a Christian family and you adopt a child from a a country that practices Buddhism primarily, and then you're going to force that child to grow up as a Christian. Why? Like, why, why, why would they automatically be a Christian? Like there, there's no reason they, that culturally, they don't come from that. Historically, they don't come from that belief system. Why do they owe that to you? That is it's just so bizarre that we would force that on anyone. So for sure, your children don't have to believe what you believe. And hopefully you're a good person who believes good things. And maybe your children will believe those things too. But the reality is, in lots of cases, we don't want children to grow up believing the things their parents believe. There's those those images of, you know, white moms yelling at Ruby Bridges as she's being integrated into a school. And those moms raised kids. Those kids are still alive today. Some of those moms are still alive today. We hope those kids are not on the same wavelength as their parents. We hope those kids became adults who believe something very different from their parents. Religiously, that wouldn't be any different. Like if your religion's teaching horrible things and you don't agree with those things, we hope you're speaking out about that, disagreeing with it, being vocal about that, choosing another religion or, or no religion if that's what's best for you. So 
oftentimes the disappointment that parents feel in their kids when they believe something very different is expressed as dishonoring their ancestors. What would your grandmother say, right? And in some cases, that can be positive. Like I, even though we are, our family's black and Jewish, I would never say the N-word because my grandfather would be, I can picture his face. So how does that affect this idea of honoring those who've come before you? I can't speak to a culture of we must honor our ancestors because it's not a culture that's American, really. <laughs> like, that's not an American. I mean, like if I'm thinking of my Asian friends who some of them have come from cultures that really, really like honor their parents. And I don't know that I was raised in that kind of culture. But I can also say you want to treat people with a baseline of respect, whether you're related to them or not. This is like, oh, there's a human being in front of me that is experiencing um, life and I'm experiencing life. And how do I treat them with a with respect or just as a human being? Um, certainly your children would owe you that, right? I mean, like, there's no reason to be cruel to someone for any reason. Like that, that that's not a that's nothing that we need to do. Um, but the idea that we owe a big Mother's Day gift or um that we should be fawning over our parents, I don't think our kids owe us that. It's really like there's the idea that I'm good because I suffered. I'm I'm a good mother because I sacrificed so much if, if my kids only knew how much I've given up for them. I, I have an empty shell of a life because I've given everything to them. And all <laughs> there's I that stereotype that of uh, there's a stereotype of the mother saying, I didn't endure 12 hours of labor, you know, right, and go through that right. just to have you speak to me that way. You're saying that's bogus. Right. Well, I'm saying that, well, I mean, that all I ask is they love and appreciate me for those sacrifices. Like that's what we're demanding. But Again, the kids didn't ask you to make any of those sacrifices. They didn't ask for any of this. So putting a burden or expectation on them that they will essentially worship you for sacrifices they didn't ask you to make is wrong. Okay, so how does this come down to chores? <laughs> right? So um, Right, yeah. right. So here's what the best case scenario is. That you love your kids, that you love them right now for who they are right this second, that you love them and you treat them with respect and you treat them as their own human being and that you're not just trying to relive your childhood through them. You're not trying to force expectations on them that they're going to become, uh, they're going to reach a certain level of education or they're going to become a big athlete or you know whatever it is that's in your head, that you have no expectations there, that you just love them and that that you're giving them all the tools they need to, you know, live a, a happy life. Like ideally that's what's happening. And part of that would be, Hey, you live in a household. If you live in a household, whatever the household is, you've got to contribute as a member of the household. So that's true. If you have roommates, that's true. If you're living alone, if you're the member of the household, you've still got to contribute. So part of that contribution is we take care of our things. That's, that's, uh, that's how we, that's part of having a good life and part of having good tools to become a, Happy, healthy adult is knowing how to take care of our things, which is chores. That means we take care of our house. We don't have huge piles of dirty laundry. We don't let mold grow on the dishes in the sink. You know, these are things that we do to, again, have a healthy, happy life. And and as members of a household, we contribute to that. So that's how I see chores playing into that. Not um, you have to do this because I'm your parent, but you have to do this because you're a member of this household, essentially. Right, right. Like you're a human that lives on the earth and this is how we live as humans. So this is, this is the deal. And, and there is some apology in there. Like, and if you hate it, if you hate every part of this, that's on me. I, I you know, I, I force you to be here. Interesting. All right. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back because I there are still some layers to dig into here with Gabrielle Blair. Her opinion is kids don't owe their parents a gosh darn thing. You're listening to Hear Me Out and I'm Celeste Headley. We'll be back in just a moment. Raising kids is one of the greatest rewards of a parent's life. But let's be real. Some days parenting can be relentless. I love my kid, but is a new parenting podcast from Wondery that shares a refreshingly honest and insightful take on parenting. Hosted by comedians Megan Gailey, Chris Garcia, and Kurt Braunohler, they will be your resident not-so-expert experts. Each week, they'll share a parenting story that'll have you laughing, nodding, and thinking, yes, I have absolutely been there. They'll talk about what went right and wrong and what they would do differently. And the next time you step on another stray Lego in the middle of the night, you'll feel less alone. 
So if you'd like to laugh while listening to comedians vent about the hardest job in the world, listen to I Love My Kid But, wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on Amazon Music or the Wondery app. This podcast is brought to you by Marvel Studios' Secret Invasion, streaming June 21st, only on Disney+. Plus. Nick Fury has returned in his most thrilling mission yet. An invasion is here, and there's no telling who the invaders are. They can take the form of anyone and have infiltrated our society and government at the highest levels. The only thing we do know, trust no one, trust nothing. In Marvel's most riveting series yet, prepare for war, prepare for fury. In Marvel Studios' Secret Invasion, don't miss the six-episode event, streaming June 21st, only on Disney+. Plus. And we're back. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. I'm Celeste Headley, and we are talking to Gabrielle Blair today. She has brought this really kind of fascinating opinion. For me, this is especially surprising coming from someone who comes from a religious background and a religious household, which is that kids don't owe their parents anything. And Gabrielle... I. I say it's surprising coming from a religious household because that's often where we hear about what you owe to your parents. Honor thy father and thy mother, right? Isn't that a commandment? One of the, one of the 10 commandments, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I'm a Buddhist and even I know that. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, I want to I dig into this a little bit further in terms of what this means for the child and their relationship to their parent. So if they don't owe their parent anything, how does that play out when parents expect them to do well in school, for example, expect them to get their homework done? Who are they doing that for if it's not to meet the expectations of their parents? The worry as a parent that your child gets good grades is because you're thinking of their future and you're worried that they're they're closing some doors let a lot of that go. Like, again, that's you as a parent putting a burden on them. Of course, you want them to get good grades because the more doors stay open. But if they're not getting good grades, something else is going on there. What's happening? Uh, Why aren't they getting good grades? It's not because they're not trying to please you. It's something else is happening. Something socially, maybe they're bored. Maybe they need a different learning style. Maybe they're not getting along with their teachers, whatever. There's some other reason they're not getting good grades, not because they're trying to mess up their future, not because they're trying to uh, destroy you, you know, they just, um, there's going to be some other reason there. And that's the thing to worry about if they're, if they're not getting good grades, not some demand that they honor you by getting good grades. That's, I, to me, that doesn't make sense at all. Interesting. I mean, I, I, you're kind of winning me over here a little bit here, but <laughs> let me go to the other end of life. Because I'm going to be yeah. honest with you, um, that, you know, there was a, a, a man on our street who, very elderly. He got COVID. He never quite recovered from it. And every time I'd Mm. see him in any way, shape or form struggling, I would think, where are his children? (laughs) I know he has children. Why aren't they watching out for him? I was wrong, by the way. They absolutely were. I just wasn't seeing it. But don't we have a responsibility to our families? Um, Isn't there something inherently human about having a family member that you watch over for and nurture and take care of? I mean, yes, I hope so. Like, again, in the best case scenario, you have nurtured and loved and taken care of your kids. And as you grow old, you continue having a great relationship with them. And they don't necessarily think of it as a burden to take care of you. They just want to take care of you. You have a great relationship in the same way you'd want to take care of a dear friend or any other loved one. Um, when we see a parent sort of abandoned by their kids, I were they ever close? I want I, I wonder, you know, I wonder were they were they, were they ever close? Is this a relationship that was ever good? How often did they see each other? Or is this what a relationship where the kids basically as soon as they became adults said, I'm not interested. I didn't like anything you kind of gave to me, any expectations you put on me. I don't really want to be invested in this in this relationship. You don't really get to see the grandkids. We're kind of done. Although that Um, that could be the kid's fault. I mean, that doesn't have to be because of something the parent did or didn't do. True. Some of this is a lottery, right? You don't get to pick your kids any more than they get to pick you. Yeah. So you could just have a crappy kid. Um, (laughs) But the idea that like, I'm going to have kids. You hear people say, I'm going to have kids because I want someone to take care of me at age. 
You hear that you don't a get lot. to have that expectation. You don't know, you know, are your kids going to outlive you? Are you going to have a kind of relationship where they can't take care of you? Are they going to be in a stable place in their own life where they have the the ability to do that for you? I mean, the idea that we would just expect that, again, doesn't make sense. In an ideal world, it wouldn't be an expectation. It would be just a lovely thing that happened because you invested in them without expectations, just because you love them and wanted the best for them. And again, weren't doing it because they'll turn around and do it for you in old age, but just because you love them. And then hopefully they return the favor. But if we had a culture, and I'm thinking of America here, where we were living, you know, three and four generations together, I may have a different take on this. I may feel like, oh, it's different. It's a different relationship. But we don't have that. We we raise our kids in isolation. It's super weird. I don't love it. Me either. And it's really expensive. Like we live a lot longer than we used to. And from 75 on, it seems to get incredibly expensive medically. And maybe your kids are having to work full time to carry your medical bills or whatever it might be. It's it's just this expectation that they owe you that is just not true. Your your kids, well, we know legally they don't. They can just say, yeah, no, we're done. And then you're just out of luck. Um, but emotionally, they also don't owe you that. I don't want them to be cruel to you. I don't want them to be jerks to you. But you don't want them to be cruel or jerks to anybody. <laughs> exactly. It's but, they, but again, this relationship that they were forced to have, they may reject at some point. And, you know, I think in most of the cases where they reject that relationship is because you were maybe not great. You know, like you, you it's hard to be a good parent. A, it's really hard. It's really hard. And maybe you haven't apologized or tried hard to repair things. And just because they have rejected you doesn't mean all hope is lost. There are people that repair their relationships as adults and, 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 and that's great. But again, the idea that like, I'm thinking if you have adult kids and you're going, I cannot believe they haven't uh, honored me for Mother's Day, or even if you have, you know, young kids, um, I just want to sit back in bed or I do whatever, like, yeah, you deserve to sit back in bed. You deserve a day off. But the idea that your kids owe you that. No, you owe your kids. Like it's hard to be alive and you force them to be alive. I, I hear complaints from people saying, all I got was a card, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but let me take this a step further, which is that we're now in this era in which some women living in particular states um, may be forced to carry to term a pregnancy they didn't intend or want. In my case, uh, my son was born because birth control is not 100% effective. It's not. <laughs> Be- it's not. Best, best accident that ever happened. I would never regret that, but that it wasn't intentional. Right. Um, does that change your view at all? Oh, when that, I mean, I don't know if you've read the stats on it, but uh, the, the outcomes for kids who were not wanted, who were basically like, forced to to a pregnancy that was basically forced to happen. It's not great. Like what we want for all children is to come to parents who sought them out and wanted them. And even in your case, where you found out you're pregnant, embrace this situation, embrace this child can say it was the best thing that ever happened to you. I mean, I don't know. And I want to backtrack and say, I don't know if you would describe your pregnancy as an unwanted pregnancy. Like once it might've been an accidental pregnancy, but I don't know that it was unwanted. If it, in the cases where women are being forced to have the baby, I would call that an unwanted pregnancy and the outcomes are not great. And will the kids love their parent? I, I have no idea. Will the parent love their kid? I'm more worried about that. And, and also not looking great. And I also want to dig into where that goes in terms of parents being inherently selfish. But we'll get into that after a break. There is so much to talk about here. My neurons are firing. Uh, We are talking to Gabrielle Blair about whether or not kids owe their parents anything. Um, I'm Celeste Headley. You're listening to Hear Me Out. Stay with us. Priceline presents Go to Your Happy Price. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. You can see yourself already there. It's beautiful. It might be sunny and sandy for some, neon and urban for others, deserts or rainforests or hiking trails. With Priceline, you can get to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else. Like up to 60% off select hotels to Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to Priceline.com and travel to your happy place for a happy price. All right, see ya. I'm off to Miami. No, actually, wow, look at that. No, I'm going to Hawaii now. Ooh, Cancun looks nice. You know what? 
Belize looks pretty nice this time of year. Or, mmm, Palm Springs. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. I'm Jonathan Braylock. I'm Jarrah Milligan. And I'm James the Third. And we're those of Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood. It's a comedic podcast that reviews films with leading actors of color and analyzes them in the context of race and Hollywood's diversity issues. Yeah. Listen to new episodes on Mondays. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. I don't care where you get them. I just want you to listen. Don't threaten the people. We need them to listen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, guys. Listen. <laughs> listen to us. Yay. Yeah, put on a happy voice. What more can I say? You know what it is? Black men can jump. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week, we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. And we're back. This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. And we are currently hearing out Gabrielle Blair, who says, parenting is an inherently selfish act, becoming a parent at least. And we should stop assuming our kids owe us anything. But I, I want to go back because we haven't touched on yet th that statement of parenting is selfish. And that's for somebody who is as associated with motherhood as you. Uh, who runs a, a, a mommy blog, <laughs> designmon.com, who writes and thinks about motherhood, who has six children, for gosh sake. To say that to become a parent is selfish is a shock to me. Um, and I say that because, look, I was a single parent for most of my adult life. Um, all kinds of things happened. They happened to everyone. What, what that landed me there, you know, if it was you know, we lived in Detroit. If somebody was going to get a new warm coat for the winter, it wasn't going to be me, <laughs> right? If somebody was going to get new clothes at, at, at the beginning of the school year, that was not going to be me. Uh, if we were going to have a dinner, it was almost always going to fit his tastes at, rather than the other way around. You have to sacrifice. You sacrifice so much for your children. So how would you suggest I reconcile this? For me, motherhood involved so much sacrifice with your idea that Becoming a parent is selfish. I love the question. I can start by saying I didn't really develop this line of thinking until, I mean, I want to say it's been the last 10 years. I already had all my kids. My youngest is 12. You know, like, so this was, this wasn't, I don't think I walked into par parenthood thinking about this at all. Um, and, and I understand that, that not everyone will experience this, but I think of the examples you just gave, which are excellent. I feel like you're describing a good parent, your child needs a coat. You again, force them to be here. Yes. Make sure they have a coat, you know, do whatever you can, whatever abilities you have, make sure that you're, you're, you're helping your child. That's, that seems like what you owe them in my mind. And those sacrifices are, are big. And I try to tell people to take parenthood super seriously. There's a chapter in my book where I say, we don't talk about how dangerous pregnancy and childbirth are. And then it follows up with, we don't talk about how difficult and just unfathomably difficult motherhood is and parenthood is. So I totally understand that. And I think it's something that we do treat really casually. Um, and I certainly approached it very casually. Like, of course, I'm going to have kids. And I grew up in a big family and I loved it. And so I want to have a big family. And my husband also had a big family. And, and we never once considered like, hey, pregnancy is really dangerous. Maybe I shouldn't be risking my body like this. Like it just didn't even occur to us. And um, anyway, so I think as a society, we do approach all of this too casually, that we should be talking very seriously, not just about the dangers of, you know, the physical dangers of pregnancy and childbirth, but how hard parenting is. It is so hard. Um, and it does require so much sacrifice and just so much time. And you can't, you can't really quantify it. And you like try and write down everything that involves. And it's like, it's impossible. It's just, it's just so all encompassing. But again, your kids did not ask you to do that. Your kids did not say, we want you 
to de dedicate the next 20 plus years of your life to me that you chose to have this baby. Like this is, and not you, I chose, and just, not just you. I mean, I chose to have six babies. So if I'm mad that I need to make sure my kids have a new coat, or I feel like that's a sacrifice, it is, but I chose that. I chose that. Um, I chose to have kids. I chose to live a life where I was going to need to make sacrifices. There are plenty of people who know they do not want to make those sacrifices and choose to have a child-free life and more power to them. They're, they are more uh, mindful going in than I certainly was, you know, that, that they say, Hey, I've seen it. I see parenthood. I see what that looks like. And I'm opting out. We're getting towards the end of this conversation. I feel like this is a good place to go because um, child-free living for women is not uncontroversial. True. So often we hear quite blatantly politicians and religious leaders saying this is our duty. We yeah. see throughout history women without children being seen as undervalued, not fulfilling their purpose on the earth. That's still happening today. Uh, mm -hmm. Women are constantly asked as soon as they get married, are you going to have kids? Um, when are you going to have kids? How many kids are you going to have? Um it's assumed often that if you're in your 30s or 40s as a female and married, you have kids. Um, so that in and of itself is not unspicy of an opinion, especially for a mom with six kids. And I have to assume <laughs> that you thought women should have children, but you don't. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, like, I love motherhood. And I... Um, again, while I didn't consider like the dangers of it, or I didn't consider how much time or energy or, you know, sacrifice it took, I definitely had a picture of what it's like to have a, um, a lot of kids. And I was seeking after that. Like I went in intentionally looking for that. And I really enjoy being a mother. I, um, I mean, I love it. I, 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 and I have, even during the hard parts, I could see why I liked this and I could see the goal. Like um, during those years where the kids are really hard, those were tricky years for me. I did not love that stage. Um, but I could see that picture of yes, but then they're all going to grow up and we're all going to, you know, everyone will be able to talk at some point and um, use the potty on their own and make themselves a snack and it's going to get better. And so that was, and that's fine. And, that, and I wanted that. Um, I don't think all women need to do that. And I certainly don't think it's like some purpose. The purpose of women is to have it like, I, that's, I find that offensive. I, I think it's really awful. I would really like to see our culture worldwide become something where, again, we're being so mindful about becoming parents that we're really thinking about, is this what I want to do? Am I ready to give these years to this child who, again, didn't ask to be here, and I'm going to need to give them everything they need for the next you know, uh, many, many years? Um, am I ready to do that? Do I understand what that means? Um, there are a lot of people that had kids that felt pressure to have kids, and I'm I don't know in this current generation how how much I mean I hope we've improved but I'm thinking of women in the 50s who was you know these stereo the stereotype we have in our heads that we know we're on a lot of antidepressants and I, I use antidepressants so it's I'm, I'm not trying to judge I'm just saying this was a, a women that have spoken openly and as they've gotten older that yeah I wouldn't have had kids if I if I could choose again um, there were people that really shouldn't have had kids or people that are, maybe they're a narcissist and they just shouldn't have kids. Like they're not going to be able to parent in a way that they need to. Um, we work from the assumption that everyone should have kids. You know, I say we, like I'm thinking as a culture, we just need to have kids. Everyone should have kids. Kids is the best. Families are the best. And I wish that wasn't true. I wish we worked from a place of Again, being so mindful, is now the time to have a kid? Should I have a child? I've thought really hard about this. Do I do I really want to do this? Do I have the support systems in place that I can, you know, help this child thrive? You know, what what do I need to do? Do we have systems? And I mean support systems like as a culture. Do we have, you know, paid family leave? Do we have um, pre-K care? Do we have, you know, like all do we have child care options? Because parenting shouldn't be as hard as it is. And I believe that as well. And um, and if you're someone who like really wants people to have children and that's really important to you, then I feel like all of your time and energy should be focused on like how to make parenting easier, which is, you know, social programs. Like, and, and I, you know, I've parented in America. I've parented in France. When we first moved to France, my youngest was just a nine month old baby. I can tell you their programs are 
make parenting easier. Like they, there, there are ways to make this easier and America chooses not to do those things. And um, so it does not surprise me when women are becoming more aware of, hey, this looks really hard. I don't want to do this. That doesn't surprise me at all. Here's the dilemma, though, Gabrielle, and I only have the one and then I had a step kid also. So I do not have all the experience that you do. But I, I know this, that no amount of reading, no amount of advice from other family members or friends can prepare you it's for true. what it is like to have a child. There's no possible way. <laughs> you can be so well, you can be a child development PhD yeah. and not be prepared for what that means for not only the the virtues that come out that feeling of absolute love but also the darker emotions that come out of anger and rage and frustration you can't be ready for how much it's going to change your life you think that you're going to be able to retain some kind of your lifestyle and your identity <laughs> and you can retain zero of it so in in a way we're asking often younger people yeah to think more carefully about this action, which all society is pressuring them to take, yeah. um, and to think through the consequences when that's not entirely possible. So where does that leave us? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot. Um, I wonder if there's something in us evolutionarily that doesn't want to hear it. Like, you're going to tell me how hard and dangerous pregnancy and childbirth is, and it's going to go in one ear and out the other, because... If we really understood, if we really understood not just pregnancy and childbirth, but how hard parenting is, the feelings you're talking about, good and bad, if we really understood it, would anyone have a child? Oh, yeah. The human probably race would die not. out. You know, yeah. probably not. So that would there's be the something end. that like blocks it. Um, that doesn't help us, though, for our conversation. Right. How can people be more mindful about this um, if, if that's if that's the case? But I do think there's some middle ground. Like, I, I, I do have some hope. I think people are having kids later. They, they, you know, we just know that statistically they're having kids later. Not everybody, um, but but it's not uncommon. I mean, I had my first child at 23. If I had stopped there, I was, you know, in my graduation robes, very pregnant, and then had the baby, you know, right after I graduated. And if I had had two kids, which is the average, I would have been done at 25. But now people are having their first kids often in their 30s. So if you have two kids in your late 30s, you know a lot more about life. You know a lot more about adulthood. You, you, you know, it's going to change your life in a way that it ne didn't necessarily change mine. My whole adulthood has been parenthood. You know, I went from college to parenthood. I didn't have any sort of like, here's adulthood now, it, you know, without kids. So it didn't change my life in the way it changes some people's lives as dramatically. But if you're having your first kids in your late thirties, I think you are consciously choosing it in the way that you wouldn't have at 23. Do you, like at 23, it's like, oh, this is what's happening. Okay. But at 37, you're like, I have seen parenthood. I've seen it with my friends. I've seen it and I want it. And maybe still a lot of the, it's the worst, it's the hardest, you know, is going out the other ear. But I still think it's a much more conscious decision the older you are. And so I, I think there, I think the idea that we could become more mindful about becoming parents and do I really want this? Do I really want this? Am I choosing this because I want it or because I feel pressure? I want to save parents? my marriage or yeah. Right. Right. And do, do I want this? If we could even get to there, how delightful it would be And it. And to be clear, it doesn't mean if you decide at 27 that no, I don't want this. It doesn't mean at 33, you'll feel the same way. Maybe you do want it then. That, that's fine. People can change. But I do wish the culture was really pushing a, do you want to do this? Is You don't have to. Do you want to do this? Do you really want to do this? Because I think if you really want this, the hard stuff is easier. That's probably a good place to end here. <laughs> Although I have a million questions that I bet our listeners have even more. Um, thank you so much for joining us. What a fascinating conversation, Gabrielle. Hey, loved it. Thank you for having me, Celeste. So talk about a conversation that really makes me think, not just think, but I have so many questions rolling around in my head right now because Gabrielle's opinion is one that has all kinds of ripple effects, right? If it is true that kids don't owe their parents anything, then what? And then what? And then what? It's... I'm going to be thinking about this for a long time. I want to say thanks to Gabrielle Blair for joining us. Uh, look, if this made me think, I know it has made you think. So if you're having these thoughts, 
I want to hear them. I want to know what questions you have or what reflections you have. You can email us and we want you to. It's hearmeout at slate.com. Some of you have used that email address already and we're so glad that you have. Uh, we want to share part of an email we got about last week's episode on the war in Iraq. A listener named Adam wrote this. I'm an Iraq war veteran, one tour, very beginning of the war. Some of what Faisal said did ring true to me. No one mentioned us tossing out candy from our care packages to kids, and I don't remember anything about how Iraqis came up to us, kissed the tips of their fingers, stomped their feet, and would say, down Saddam, to us. He's right, Saddam had to go. But the way we went about it, it needs to be addressed that it was more than just faulty intelligence. That's a lazy headline. Thank you so much for writing in, Adam. Um, if you're listening and you have feelings about Iraq or parenting, or maybe a topic that you want us to tackle, we would love to hear from you. Again, our email address is hearmeout at slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind, but keep it open. I'm Jonathan Braylock. I'm Gerard Milligan. And I'm James III. And we're the hosts of Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood. It's a comedic podcast that reviews films with leading actors of color and analyzes them in the context of race and Hollywood's diversity issues. Yeah. Listen to new episodes on Mondays. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. I don't care where you get them. I just want you to listen. Don't threaten the people. We need them to listen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, guys. Listen. <laughs> Listen to us. Hey. Yeah, put on a happy voice. What more can I say? You know what it is? Black men can jump. In Hollywood.